Hi, friends. Host Eric here. Host of Talking with Famous People. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about brain fog. The newest hot story going around regarding COVID. So reportedly, people who've had COVID have these long-lasting after effects, which they have deemed brain fog. But some days they'll be feeling really foggy, and some days they'll be fine. They might go away for a week and then come back. Yada, yada, yada. So I'm not sure if this is going to pan out to actually be something or not. Like, uh, I remain utterly unconvinced that this is a phenomenon that's linked, that's actually linked to COVID. I think it's... Well, you know, after I read about it, I was sort of paying attention to the thing. And hi, Alt. Glad to have you here. Uh, we'll be needing to do some map making today for sure. Um, I was sort of on the lookout for it in my own head. And, of course, I found it. And the thing is, what they've already determined is there's no constricted blood flow to the brain. There's no obvious inflammation in the brain. So there's no obvious cause for this brain fog. But, you know, well, we've got reputable people like, you know, recovering nurses and doctors reporting it. Of course, if you look at the actuality of it, it's a hot mess of a topic. Some doctors say it's psychosomatic. Some doctors think it's a real thing, but they just don't know what the link is. It only applies to some people who've had COVID and not others. It doesn't seem to be linked to severity of the, the disease. Um, I mean, I'm pretty convinced it's psychosomatic. So we're having another instance of mass hysteria here. So, <clears throat> of course, that does play right into the hands of the uh, COVID alarmists. Um, because they're going to say, well, you see, you see, we didn't, we don't know all the impacts of COVID. And they also have some other long-term lasting effects that we don't know about. Blah, 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 blah. Well, of course, who knows if and when they're ever going to establish this brain fog links to COVID at all. Uh, it sounds to me like a person's regular ups and downs, but now they're paying attention and looking for brain fog. That's what it sounds like to me. You know, it's like I, I have my normal ups and downs. When I had, felt like I had brain fog the other day, well, it was late. I smoked a bunch of bowls. <laughs> I was tired. I've been up for a while. And, yeah, it's feeling a little foggy. But it what mostly made me think was, okay, I see what's going on. If it, if it can happen to me, it can happen to every. It will happen to everybody else. Brain you know? fog? Yeah, like, yeah. if I'm susceptible to the uh, suggestion in the media of brain fog, because I think I probably have had COVID, um, then everybody's more susceptible to it than me, probably. Most people are. So, uh, I mean, I it's a lot of time on planes. <laughs> well, it's just, uh, you know, it's like, if you read these articles, they... Uh, they tend to be filled with anecdotes from people who are reporting these symptoms, which are vague symptoms like, I just can't concentrate, and I I feel like I'm forgetful now, and words escape me, and humanity, yeah, right? Um, now, I'm not sure about this one yet. It may turn out to be that um, there's something real here, and it's of some sort of significance. Thing is, we're starting to open up a bit again, but of course, exactly what I said is what's happening. There's absolutely no reason whatsoever to think that now when we open back up, we're not going to once again see a spike of COVID cases. People in groups hanging out together spread illnesses. It's what happens. Now, what basically we're trying to do here with the human human health 
is we are treating it like um, we are treating it as uh, like we treated the forests for the 20th century. So in the 20th century, the Forest Service, what did they do? They put out all the fires. They put out all the fires. And why did they put out all the fires? Because fires are bad, right? Fires kill things. Now, what happened down the road? Well, we had forests that were choking on overgrowth. And additionally, we had mega fires. That is to say, once finally a fire did happen, despite the Forest Service best efforts, the amount of fuel was so big that it was much more damaging than an oil fire. Killed the whole forest, burned it so heavily that the uh, recovery it recovered into a different kind of ecosystem. So, in other words, under normal forest fires, they, a lot of the trees survive and uh, it thins out the weaker stuff in the forest and, um, and life goes on as usual. But if you don't, if you stop all those small fires, then you have these mega fires and serious problems, and you're just you're trying to fight nature, right? Well, that's exactly what we're doing with COVID. So human beings need to interact with each other to pick up each other's little viruses and stuff and build an immune system. That's how our immune system builds up its repertoire of tools. It's how our immune system remains robust. It's why we don't want to isolate our kids when they're little. You know, you want them to go out in the world and get exposed to some germs. They, yes, they're going to get sick. That's okay. Um, so. I wanted to say that if um, everyone in adult swim is rooting for the Abraham Lincoln slutty yeah, outfit. We're gonna have to put like, it together for real. So. I know. That's I'm like I'm like, I don't know, guys. We'll get it done. We'll get it done. Okay. If it's, if people care, we'll get it done. Yeah, they do. <laughs> um so uh right. We don't want to try to create a world in which nobody's allowed outside unless there's everyone's guaranteed that no one's going to spread any sickness. That's stupid. That's unrealistic. I mean, I accept at this point that we've got this terrible new norm where everybody's got to wear masks all the time. Um, and I, I tend to agree with John Murphy. Lack of exercise, mental stimulation, vitamin D deficiency, and stress all people can never shut down. Maybe these things are the brain fog. Right, well, it's because it's like, what happened to our lives? We were all in the middle of things, had, having plans, having expectations, building lives around the assumption that the world wasn't going to dramatically change in the next few months, right? Uh, and then all of a sudden it did, and everyone was all, eh, freak out, freak out, freak out. And now, I mean, I think what it is is this. It may be cognitive dissonance. Mm. These people who who push so hard for this stuff are now still clinging to the idea that they were right, and yet knowing that it, it's hurting them and everybody else so much and that they were wrong, you know? So we'll see about this whole brain fog thing. You know, it's conceivable that there's something particularly nefarious about COVID that does something that no other coronavirus does. It's, uh, I doubt it. I really do. I think it's basically just a souped up common cold that's highly contagious because nobody has any immunity. To it. Yeah. That's what I was thinking it was, too. The client has updated the session date to 10 17 at 10 a.m. p.m. So, okay, which one am I moving? The Thursday night midnight one to 1017. So I'm moving the Friday morning one to the 17th. At 10 a.m. 
10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Save. Okay, it is on my calendar now. Well, John Murray, I think it's going to be – I think we have to wait to see how it plays out. I mean, it depends how well we react to and learn from this process. If we, if we don't learn anything, we don't, we don't change the way we think and talk about making these kind of decisions, then it will be because especially if it sets precedent for this is how we do things going on forward, then, I mean, what a nightmare. Um, Isaiah Root asks if his ESTP friend could join the room while you type her and participate, possibly. Um, sure. That's fine. If she doesn't, yeah, if she doesn't mind, if the client doesn't mind, that's fine. Um... Well... The thing is, at the end of the day, I just can't help but feel somewhat bad because you just you can see the both the vulnerability and the lack of a good relationship with the vulnerability. And it, and it gives me pause, you know. I like my enemies to be nice and, like, there's no good enemies in the world. No. That's the problem. There's no good enemies. I want my enemies to be fucking rotten. Air, it's like arrogant, haughty, um, just, like, spoiled, full of themselves. Haven't been taken down a peg. Successful and and walking around with a lot of swagger and ego and stuff. I want to take down those people. I think you can. There's no one better to do to to do that. There aren't really that many of those people. Well, not that we know of. Like. I mean, I don't, I don't regret anything. I want to stress that. The big difference between regretting and having moistures. So, no matter how hard we try, we cannot completely waterproof our tenders. Some moisture will seep. And um, the key thing for me is I, I don't mind moisture seepage, but I don't want to have regrets. And as everybody keeps pointing out, there's nothing really to regret here. So, um, because there's been no significant progress in the pandemic. What does that even mean? It means Eric's prediction that we wouldn't be able to, um, that quarantine wouldn't do any good. And as soon as we start quarantine, the pandemic would just spike up again. It's proved to be true. Well, hello, Skyger. Are you still Lord of the Promiscuous Any Tool? Hey, it's good to see you. It's been a bit. You use space object and time object really naturally. That's great. Your six-year-old ESFP brother makes fun of you for not being a censor now. Oh, my god! Does he call gosh. you an intuitard? <laughs> that is funny. You just got to teach him the word intuitard, and then you're all so set. Then that. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. Oh, my gosh. It's like. It's amazing. <laughs> that's, that's so gratifying to hear that. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. 
Oh my gosh, it's hysterical. Yeah, that's pretty great. That, yeah, that, that is. It's, it's pretty cool when you're position that they come up with uh, like, you know, it's almost due to come up with that quick. But uh, I was early enough on the, I was an early enough adopter that I, I was, I had, it was still on the tree for me to pick when oh, I got yeah. there, you know. You used it. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's yours. Um, I kind of want to like up my ontology. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that? Um, smoking a joint. Oh, you want to smoke a joint? Okay, sure. I should watch some joints. Yeah. And I'm getting in comfy mode. <laughs> My joints are. Smoke two joints in the morning. Smoke two joints at night. Smoke two joints in the afternoon. Make me feel all right. Smoke two joints. Is that a real song? Racism will be replaced with be replaced with typism. Huh. Well, at least typism is talking about something real, you know. Yeah. It's like it's one of the only ways I can think to describe a person that's actually fair. Because if you were to replace with Big Five, that wouldn't be fair. Um, it would be like, it, it seems to, the Big Five seems to reject any expression of yourself as, in terms of a set of useful skills. You know, whereas at least typology, you can always say, hey, listen, I know I'm an INFP, but I have just as strong a strength as your strengths are strong, and you have just as weak a weaknesses as my weaknesses are weak. And then, you know, the F5 polar person goes, yeah, but your strengths are stupid. Oh. And then the INFP goes, Eric, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know There's something that I really uh, value about F.I. Polar, like the way that like when we were with Delilah, the song like that came on and she like almost started crying and then like you and there's a moving scene too. It, I, I'm i a little jealous. Like it's nice that uh, she's right. I'm going to take the advice of uh, that artist she told me about and see if maybe I can conjure up some tears. I mean, that's another F.I. polar person who goes from perfectly fine to crying to perfectly fine in a total grand total of 10 seconds. Yeah. Yep. Is cog functionism a subcategory of type of discrimination? Um, maybe. Maybe it is. Maybe. 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 Maybe not. But a hard of hall. You're right, I don't know. I get really not. You gotta work, work really hard. Really hard. You gotta work out for a long time. Like such a long time. I don't have that kind of patience. No, I'm like a fucking seven, eight, four. I don't fucking like wake up anyone. I was like, I can barely wait a lot at Starbucks. Oh my god, the last Starbucks! Oh my god. Oh really? Their line moves pretty fast. Well, like that's like only your opinion. <sighs> um, that's a great like uh, skit in the making where somebody comes up to something and they're like, "She's like, how do you like my dress?" And she's like, it's, "Oh my gosh, it's so cute." And just, you know, that's only your opinion. <laughs> it's not a fact. Some do. <coughs> you know? <laughs> yes, isn't that what you asked me for? <coughs> <coughs> Neurovision is hot. Is that when you look at someone's brain? 
type police brutality and targeting TI for images. That wasn't even brave at all. Somebody give me another type police person right now. Somebody find me somebody in type police. I'm gonna do it right now. We're gonna do it right now. Fuck it. I'm gonna get another type police to get the wash the taste out of the last guy out of my mouth. Okay. So I get a my police hat. Like hey, face right mash here. again. Oh, you changed your icon to another BTS dude. I like that they have uh, different color hair, like a lot of them. Uh, Sky Gear, Lord of the Promiscuous, and E Tool is very happy to hear. <gasps> oh my goodness, yes. Somebody get me a link, please. Where is there anybody that's going to get me a link? I'm going to type police somebody. I already did, Frank James. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. You got it. You got to give me Try somebody good. Might... Somebody's got to find somebody good. You just I just throw to... random shit, you know? I've typed most of those people, probably. I've typed most of them before. Oh, it's the same guy? He, I guess he just likes to change his hair color a lot. I could relate. I, I feel like um, I'm just growing my hair out. No. I like my hair short, but that's what I do. I grow it long and I cut it. Well, I need a real thing to type, please. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you can request a typing session with Rachel. And yeah, sure. sure. You know what? You taught yourself how to play a type, please, song on the piano? That's fantastic. I'd love to hear it. Are codependents and RNFJs <laughs> the same? God. Is Ross Rosenberg reportedly a, an INFJ? Let's see. Okay. Today we're talking to Ross Rose. He's got 183,000 subscribers. Oh That's cool. All right, let's watch this thing. So people watch. He's got subs well. They, he's got subscribers. Yeah. Let me just do display capture. Yeah. And then let me pop the meow out like meow. I can bring like this, but like, yeah. And we're gonna start recording as per the meow. Put that down there like that. Well, hi friends. Today, not this lady. We've got this gentleman here, Ross Rosenberg. Who, like a lot of people on the internet, calls himself an INFJ. The real question that we hear at the type police ask about these matters is, but is he really an INFJ? And we're going to find out right now after this exciting theme song. Try as you might. You just can't hide. Oh, I've got to edit it in. All right, let's see what he has to say. And so, you know, I I just couldn't deal with the shame, you know, being a psychotherapist, that me, you know, the guy who tries to help people solve their problems and, you know, couples therapy, marital therapy, and yet I was kept falling in love with these harmful women. So I dug really, really deep in my own therapy and started to realize that there are forces inside of us that compels us to find a partner who feels right, who is a perfect fit. Kind of like a dancing couple. You know, you know, you got a leader and you got a follower. And if the dance is gonna feel right, the two have to be matched and they're opposite. They have their opposite roles, and if they both want to dance. They will be attracted to each other. So then came this idea of 
these codependents who are selfless, altruistic, patient, kind, giving, they always seem to fall in love with this harmful person. And but the harmful person is the opposite. They're they're Okay. Well, right off the bat, let me just say. Nothing good. And nothing jumps out at me as um, alarming right off the bat. I'm not quite sure why I pulled this guy over, but we'll see. We'll see what kind of suspicious behavior he has. Uh, If he starts acting suspicious, maybe we'll uh, strip search him, do a cavity search. I do enjoy a good cavity search, like most police officers. Um, let's see what else he has to say. <coughs> they're self taking <coughs> They're entitled. They're controlling. And I came up with this idea that unconsciously, codependents are tr- attracted to their opposite narcissists. Um, like magnets. Magnets, you got the North Pole is always attracted to the South Pole. If you have two uh, magnets that are north and north, they, 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 they push each other away. So the human magnet syndrome became the idea that explains to the world why codependents reflexively, predictably, predictably, and eventually fall in love with narcissists. Yeah, it's, it, it happens so much to me, honestly. And all SLVs are codependents were born in families in which they suffered attachment trauma, uh, which is early childhood trauma because one of their parents was a pathological narcissist, had a personality disorder, uh, had um, um, had a narcissist before. And when you are born with a pathological narcissist, there's two things you can take. You can figure out how to be the child that the narcissist always wanted and be the trophy child, the pleasing child, the child that feels like a gift to the narcissist. If you can somehow mold yourself into the prince, the princess, the overachiever, the quiet one, the beautiful one, somehow you can mold yourself to be the extension of the narcissist. And in your childhood, you've got conditional love. If you please the narcissist, if you don't anger the narcissist, if you don't disappoint the narcissist, say it's your dad, then you you are the center of that narcissist's life. And you learn early on that to be loved, you have to make someone happy while dismissing your own natural um, inclination to yourself. Now on the other hand, since codependency or self love deficit disorder is caused during the child attachment, um, um, process. Um, they, the same ch- um, in the same family, a sibling who cannot be, find a way to please their parent, who can't be the apple of their eye, would love the uh, child. And that child, like any other person, will trigger the narcissist with narcissistic injury. The narcissist needs children to feel good about themselves. And the child they feel good is going to be um, at the losing end of their attention. They're going to either be ignored, they're going to be um, the target for their anger, they're going to trigger narcissistic injury. So that child's attachment which is so important. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any initial problem here at all. He seems INFJ-ish. He's been the thing that's running afoul of my INFJ radar. I'm going to look at a couple other videos here and see what else he talks about. Maybe see what he does in a non-interview context. You look good in a hat. Thanks, darling. You're welcome. Women love a man in uniform. That's what they say. That's what they say. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm not. I always say watch out for the men in uniforms. Let's watch this one. Adult children of alcoholism, alcoholic. My dad wasn't really exactly an alcoholic, but you know, whatever. He was a drinker, I guess. My family are drinkers. Welcome to my latest YouTube video. Today I'm going to really talk about ever. codependency, or what I call self-love deficit disorder, and adult children of alcoholics. But before we begin, let me explain the name so we know what we're talking about. Adult children of alcoholics, which used to be called ACOAs, they're called ACAs now, is a designation for a person who was raised in a family in which there was an alcoholic parent. Because of the alcoholic's psychological problems, these would be their addiction. Their children were subjected to neglect, abandonment, and abuse. Some very direct and some subtle. A person with self-love deficit disorder, or as some people know, codependency, explains the caretaker, the person who in relationships takes care of others before they take care of themselves. 
They only know one way to exist in relationships is to love and respect and care for others. Hope that that will be reciprocated. Because of the human magnet center, they habitually, reflexively choose narcissists. They never get the reciprocity and the mutuality that they so much desire. But because they're SLDs, the codependents, they stay in a relationship. So SLDs, as defined in my human magnet center book, simply are individuals who give all of the love, respect, and caring away to others, want it to be reciprocal. It's not, and they stay in a relationship. For further information you about SLED be. or codependency, please read my book, The Human Magnet Center. So we are talking about two types of individuals, and the differences are the ACA was subjected to a family, a father, a mother who is an alcoholic, and often, but not always, another parent who is a co-addict. A co-addict is different from an SLD or a codependent. An addict or an alcoholic has all sorts of psychological, personal, and social deficits judgment problems, insight problems, problems with the law, problems with working, problems with relationships That's and families and emotional expression because of the drug that they're addicted to. They choose the drug over their loved ones because of the nature of an addiction. It is a terrible disease, it's a terrible disorder, and it commandeers one's mental health, one's personality. It creates a desire to satiate a craving that will push a person, compel a person to do things that he or she would normally not do if they were not an alcoholic. So if you are a child raised by a parent who's an alcoholic, or for that matter, a drug addict, it means, more than likely, that you live in a family environment with chaos, unpredictability, harm, abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, neglect, abandonment. It is impossible. Okay, well, you know, I want to comment on that a little bit, because I'm not sure he's an INFJ, but I, I've gotten distracted by this topic. As, as a recovering alcoholic and somebody who is an alcoholic parent, let me say um, two things, uh, one on either side of the matter. For sure, Delilah's experience having an alcoholic parent was nothing like what he's describing. And you could easily enough have called my dad an alcoholic parent, although really more just like a fairly heavy drinker. He had such sort of protocols and organization about drinking it was like he drank in the evenings till he went to bed after work. It was just it was that was it. And it was was never there was never any violence or yelling or it was never any drunkenness. It was just um they'd quietly read their books in their chairs until it was bedtime, you know. Um so the thing is, it's a little bit off putting to me to hear this guy uh speak <coughs> so With such, with such venom towards the idea that, of an alcoholic parent, because you know, I I think I did a pretty good job as an alcoholic parent, frankly. Um, you know what I I find um, because I've been in a lot of groups, um, I find that the parent actually does a good job, like. They're, they may be missed things sometimes, but in general, like, I've never heard a story where... I mean, there are awful stories. You know, and there, were, there were moments when I was a drunk parent that I I felt like the next morning, like, oh, shit, I was not a good parent last night or something, you know? I had those moments. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to disagree entirely with, with the gist of what he's saying. For example, it's definitely the case that Delilah has been traumatized, was, was traumatized by it, like... She has nightmares sometimes about me drinking. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I can't deny that. Um, regardless, um, INFJ is not out of the question here at all, but uh, let's explore what else this person could possibly be. That's a be. good idea. Because he's not exactly full on textbook INFJ. Uh, but I don't, I doubt there's going to be enough. To to put in the slammer, but let's see what he else he had to say. Oh, she didn't get any of that talking. That's fine. I'll have to edit that out. All right, so let's see what else he had to say. Nearly impossible for a person who is in the throes of alcoholism to meet the needs of their children or for anyone in their family. The addiction is so strong, so compelling that the addict, the alcoholic, is going to choose the booze, the alcohol for anything else. And the results are disastrous. There are so many scarred and psychologically impaired people because they were raised in a family with an alcoholic in such an environment 
especially when very young, during the critical time <coughs> of development, which we call the attachment stages, their emotional, verbal, and, so, and the more disassociated ACA is the rest. And there are so many other potential outcomes for an ACA. So what I'm saying is, Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Ross Rosenberg, the author of New Magnetism, the creator of the Code Pencil Field. I'm really happy to stop by and check out my YouTube channel. You're going to find a lot of videos here that I believe and I hope will contain it. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Ross Rosenberg, the author of New Magnetism, the creator of the Code Pencil Field. I'm really happy to stop by and check out my YouTube channel. You're going to find a lot of videos here that I believe and I hope will contain information that you need to know because of what you are going through now. It is my greatest pleasure to take my own lessons, whether derived from my own psychotherapy, my own healing journey, or from my own experience as a psychotherapist. The idea that I can teach you how to be happier, to resolve trauma, whether it was a long time ago in your childhood or the trauma you have right now, excites me. I, not too long ago, started this YouTube channel just with the idea that I would have a menu to post some of my live seminar training videos. And it has evolved into a place where I can share my own experiences, thoughts, information, ideas, and recommendations with a growing community, all of whom wants to solve the problem of these human magnets in induced relationships. Understand more about narcissism, the toxicity and the harm that narcissists cause to understand the codependency of what I call self-love. Well, it's hard to tell somewhat what's going on with this guy because he's talking about stuff that I suspect he's very comfortable talking about. He speaks very fluidly and even reasonably quickly when I don't have it on 1.5, I guess. Uh, is there any non-narcissist stuff? Gaslighting, brainwashing, gaslighting basics from A to Z. Korean War to come back. You 
have to deprogram them. You have to help them see that their thoughts are not theirs. Because, and when someone starts to see it, it's almost like there's a chemical reaction and they shut up and they cry, they sob, and they say, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened to me. But yes, that self-esteem and the psychological problems that created a put penalty years later, so in order to really cure them, not only you have Okay, let's talk about this guy. Um, uh, he seems awfully T.E. Yeah. You know, he seems like maybe a nice ESTJ. Mm-hmm. If you think, of, if you see all the shit he's got done as well, that'd be more consistent with ESTJ. The various, like, tying shit in with each other's stuff, you know, that kind of thing. Yep. Um... I had it at two times for a while. I'm trying to just get as much information as possible from him. Um, he seems to have possibly, uh, you know, I, I see him as having either third or sixth slot in E, the way he talks. He's, mm-hmm. he's not, he doesn't have a straight up NI kind of normal approach. I don't think he's an ENTJ. I think an ENTJ. Might sound like that with six slot any, but um, I mean, I think of Chad Crandall, he's pretty chatty in that kind of a fashion. But this guy seems more like like front stack any to me. You- so, would that be ESTJ? Yeah, I'm thinking ESTJ because I was thinking that first two just based on the way his layout is done and like the amount of. You know, organization to his his uh, everything, his page, his whole page is, and he's an expert on narcissism mostly and relationships. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to move now, if possible, to the uh, mm-hmm. type court. Anyone who wants to be a juror in the type court, could you please go to whereby.com slash TWFP one. Can I get in there? Let's see. Hey, what do you know? All right, so there's 12 spots okay. in here, which is perfect for a jury, you know? That is. Hey, Sean uh, O'Neill. So what we'll do is we're going to share some of these videos here. We're going to share another one of this guy's videos for a while. We're going to have everyone take a look at it. And um, this is... Uh, Be the trial to see if he goes to jail, I guess. Is he supposed to be INFJ? It's supposed to be INFJ. Yeah. Yeah, because, like, even, like, the best INFJ is still going to stumble. It's like, and he's not stumbling. He's he's just being verbose and highfalutin with words for no reason. Like, subject to being withheld. Like, you would just say you were neglected. You wouldn't go through all this shit, right? Like, Hi, Chris Chapman. We're going to wait till about, hopefully, a few more people get here, and then I'm going to launch a video here for us to look at together. We'll discuss it briefly, and we'll see if we think this guy belongs in a slam. Or we'll take a vote, and we'll either set him free or sentence him to 40 days hard labor. To be fair, I'm out of my depth anyway. I just don't like... Hey, kind of it's a journey of his peers. He can't ask for anything better than that. Yeah. Uh, if there's anybody else in the live stream who would like to join the jury over here, uh, yeah, I'll put the thing on here. No, you can do it on your phone. Yeah. Uh, whereby.com slash TWFP. It's actually really good one. on your phone, too. Especially if you have an iPhone. It's good quality. Whereby. Okay. So I'm going to give everybody about, we've got, Seven more slots, but I will give everybody till 5.30. That's two minutes, and then we're going to uh, begin the proceedings. You can still participate if you come in late, I guess, but you might have to be an alternate juror if you didn't catch all the evidence. Well, we're presenting evidence in a case against one Mr. Uh, one Mr. What was his name again? Ross Rosenberg, something like that. Ross Oops. Oh, poo. (laughs) 
um, at the losing end, uh, let me go to the panel they're again going here. to be the beat. And let's see if he's got anything else. What he's got about I J besides just that, if anything. Welcome right. to and, my YouTube yeah. channel. I'm Lars Rosenberg, the author of The Human Man. Uh, let's see here. Is it all about narcissists? Why is it so narcissist heavy? I know a lot of shitty channels like that too. They're just like, ugh. like what? A lot of like shitty channels like that. Just like just so people can go re relive their drama. Like you know, that's that's the whole point. Oh, there's nothing yeah. bad segue. There's no like, there's no congrats for getting on it. There's never a move forward message. It's just relive it. It's awesome. Mm. The ones that's really like clickbaity are the ones that like. All right, well, let's try this one. Let's watch this one for a bit. Uh, you're becoming the narcissist, right? Like, it's the whole thing. I can't, I can't agree. You're talking at the same time. Then they have these other ones where it's like they're trying to get the abused people to like basically become narcissists. So they're just getting their ego. They're like, the narcissist will fear you and blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, that's, I've seen those. So my latest YouTube video. My name is Ross Rosenberg. I am the author of The Human Magnet Syndrome and the creator of the Codependency Cure, or its other name, Self-Love Recovery Treatment Program. Today I'm here to talk to you about marriage therapy and how extremely dangerous it can be if it is with a, with a codependent or what I call it. The more licenses you have, the more TV you have. Please know that I changed the name codependency to self-love deficit disorder, SLDD, and the codependent is now the self-love deficient, or SLD. So this video highlights the absolute danger um, and my opinion <laughs> for any SLD, whether in recovery or still kind of stuck in, in the disorder, to be in marriage therapy. I almost always, across the board, recommend no to it. Now, I, let me just be really clear and, and tell you a little bit about my background. You know, I'm a licensed psychotherapist. I've been in the field 32 years. I got a license and a bunch of uh, certification credentials. Um, and I also um, was trained and experienced as a marriage and family therapist. And I am a great fan and supporter of marriage therapy. Let me... Do not go to marriage therapy if you are an SLD because it is an accident waiting to happen. Let me begin with something that I talk about in great lengths in the four hour buyer's guide to good psychotherapy video, which is available at selfloverecovery.com. Not all therapists are the same. And I cannot overemphasize that. There are so many different types of educations and trainings. Once you accept that as a fact, then you have to consider the difference in theoretical orientation. We therapists require a theoretical orientation in order to instruct our approach to therapy. Think of it like, if, if any of you guys are computer geeks, think of it as firmware, which is a software that instructs any uh, a piece of technology, whether it's a phone or a computer, of the work. A theoretical orientation gives direction and guidance to the therapist. So, you know, whether they're an employee in psychoanalytic uh, theory, their cognitive behavioral theory, self psychology theory, I think there's a myriad of theoretical orientations. Uh, it, it gives the therapist an explanation for the problem, why the problem and ultimately the solution to resolve, a solution or, or direction to resolving the problem. Now to be fair, someone who has been in the field as long as I have, um, or, or you know, a good amount of time, they operate by a number of theoretical orientations. The other thing is, is that not everyone has mastery of what they have learned. Uh, that goes all the way back to education. You can go back to um, their mastery 
uh, basic counseling skills or their mastery of theoretical a theoretical orientation. Um, in addition, and, and this is probably the most profoundly important element, is not all therapists have the same level of positive or good mental health. I've talked about this in any one of my videos or live seminars, especially in my buyer's guide to good psychotherapy. A psychotherapist is only as good as their mental health and their ability to see their own problems within themselves. So if you are a psychotherapist with mental health problems, say you are SLD, or for that matter, say you are pathological narcissist, you know, narcissistic personality disorder or other uh, narcissistic disorders. Um, you. Oh, wait for some epic drama. The psychotherapist is only as good, and he's like whispering it and going all slow, and he comes in. And then he's all right, let's go one at a time. One at a time here. One at a time. Thoughts about INFJ? We'll start with you, Sean. I don't think he's in a temperament. Like, I'm not really familiar with this kind of thing, but just the analogies are poor on the book. The visual's really terrible with barbed wire and magnet. Analogies clashing like crazy, making my head explode. I don't like the way he talks. He sounds like the ST clear guy. Like, I don't like it. Okay. I don't think he's high. Okay, Chris Chapin, what are your thoughts on it? INFJ. I, I don't know. I wasn't opposed to INFJ before this session, uh, but I'm seeing some appeals to SI and FI when he's qualifying the credentials of other people in his field. He, it depends on, if there's a variety of factors it can depend on, right? And it's, it has to do with their mastery. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's... He seems to eat to me. That's not a very convincing reason for anything. Uh, he doesn't seem NI in the way he talks to me. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Uh, A says specifically, let me read the chat so I can see what A says. A says, you should check out Grant Cardone's cell. It's very different TESE. So what's your point then, uh, Archfiend? Do you think he's INFJ or not? Oh, Grant Cardone's not INFJ. No, I'm talking about, I'm talking about this guy. I don't even know who that other person is. I'm saying, is this guy oh. INFJ? Yeah, this guy. Grant. I think I have an argument. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if I really feel like this is a person with um, with uh, any in the fourth. Um, I agree. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I just, I'll say what you just did, Chris. He, that guy I cannot do. Like, no, what, what did just, I do? We're talking about, well, what I think, what I feel, and you're so into that, that guy had no space for that at all. Like, that's what I'm saying. Mm. It's fundamentally different. Like, he's all tight. It, it seemed to me that he was doing a lot of um, NE from SI. So he's mm. talking a lot about stuff he already knows, which, you know, everybody does when they have an expertise necessarily. So it's not to be unexpected that he's going to talk about material he already knows as an expert in the thing he's talking about, right? But um, I think it, you know, the way it kind of settles into to a rambling lecture is kind of reminiscent of ESTJ and much less so of an INFJ's presentational approach, perhaps. But even when the NF is rambling, they're talking about their expertise. They're going to be passionate about it. It's going to be beautiful. Fucking hippie language, man. Like, you're going to be like, oh, it's like smoking that shit. Like, it's not, it's not Ben Stein putting you to sleep shit, you know? <laughs> so you, you don't think he's passionate enough? I don't think he could be NF temperament at all. Like, no, I don't think so. I love listening to NF people just talk about their stuff. I, I one think... One thing, go, Chris, just say one thing. It just draw everyone in. It's just it's comfortable to, to share. It's like one slight, tiny little thing. You know? But the uh, authenticity is just magnet. So. Well, he's very business-minded, and he has multiple books. Not just one. He has multiple. Plus, he has seminars. I'm not really sure an INFJ can carry out all of that. He's made quite a business out of his uh, being a therapist or whatever. Of course, he's been at it for a number of years. He definitely he seems to take a team. this video but stay attractive, like in any, any capacity. You cannot say it, man. Like, come on. It, look, it, it, it seems like he's 
coming at it with a TV perspective. Let's watch another pe another piece of a different video, okay? <laughs> I put this trend to now. This is like the good therapy. Just mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone needs some good therapy on other types sometimes. Okay, yeah. Let's see about this one. Uh, I would love to meet another ENFJ male, like one that exists for All right, so let me put that here. Hold on a second. Uh, share. Ah. Cancel. YouTube. Yeah. Paste. And yeah. Welcome to my latest YouTube video. My name is Ross Rosenberg. I'm the author of The Human Magnet Syndrome and the creator of The Codependency Cure. Today I'm going to talk about one of my favorite books, a book that I used to use all the time when I was a couple of marriage therapists. It's a book that has sold millions of copies, and I'm just going to guess around three to five million copies. It's called The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. The application of this book can be dangerous to an SLD or codependent in marriage or couple centers. It is not because this book in any way is a bad or dangerous book. Quite the contrary. This book is especially helpful for a relationship in which each person has the capacity to communicate what they need, empathy for the other person, the ability to sacrifice their needs in order to take care of other persons with the understanding that that person will do the same. In other words, <coughs> who are in their relationship where they don't feel loved, but yet they do love their partner and believe their partner is capable of wanting to love them back. The presumption is that each person in the relationship has the capacity to want to listen, to listen, to empathize, who want to try to meet the other person's needs. They also have the capacity to learn from their mistakes, capacity to overcome their feelings. Okay. <clears throat> so, A plus and boring. He gets an A plus and boring. Fine. He, he also gets, though, <clears throat> you know, like a solid A and A plus and inoffensive as well. If you actually are an EF, you'll be like, using these concepts and my strategies, we can get connected. <laughs> Tomorrow, he's just like, this book, like a book, it's a book book, and you take a you wait your book, and you take another book for it, and you book it, and you turn into something else. Same box. Like. Chris? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really value my ability to contribute to this conversation, but I think that was a really interesting observation by Sean. Um, <laughs> Right there, that that it is like referencing uh, to the I I, I don't know. To yeah, to the, the book. book. Yeah, but he has not even like he he's like I have tips. It's all in this book. It's gonna set you up for so many things. You're not even gonna believe it. This changes, no. that changes, but he doesn't go into specifics. <laughs> yeah, he he just wants you to buy the book. He doesn't want to tell you the advice. He doesn't care. He yeah. wants you to buy the book. Okay, um, so look, who here thinks he's an I, he's it, it, it doesn't matter really whether he's trying to sell a book or not. <laughs> you know, the point is, is he an INFJ? We are trying to determine if he committed a type crime, no. not some other kind of crime. No, I I say no to INFJ. Hey, well, we're gonna take a vote. I'm gonna vote that's no on INFJ. I'm gonna, that's two. I'm gonna, that's two. Sean, what are you voting? He's not INFJ. He's Three. not Ken Lover. Okay, Chris Chapman, what are you voting? Now, actually, let me okay, let me step back. Let me step back. Remember, the reality, the real question here is, do we have enough suspicion of not INFJ enough beyond a reasonable doubt to put him in the slammer for the type crime of mis self identification? Because um, he's not. Uh, he, I don't think. 
I, I'm going to say, yeah, I think he's guilty of not being an INFJ. I'm not exactly sure yeah. what he is, but I don't think he's an INFJ. Yeah. 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 Um, so he did a little thing there where he moved with his hands, so he was explaining a concept. Seems like that. Uh, seems like that he was signalizing a concept, which seems like very heavy the I language. And even though, uh, even though ISTJ is the I demonstrative, and ESTJ is the I ignoring, those aren't conscious functions. So I think there is some slight evidence for INFJs, especially if you look at this watery eyes which would be FI, then a lot of other INFJs seem to sort of have watery eyes. This is a very strange random phenomena uh, or, or surrounding types. It is not very strong conception. But we have, to, we have to realize the fact that the world is made up of 16 types, and they cannot be represented as disproportionately. And therefore, even in some strange circumstances, there will be types that don't seem to fit, even in mannerisms and behavior. And we have to sometimes look at the more subtle clues to differentiate the types properly. Okay, okay we got the defense attorney. Good. So um, before we before we conclude this, we'll make sure the defense attorney has another chance to speak on on behalf of this client. Do you mind uh, being the defense attorney pile of dirt? Well, so take that as a no, he doesn't mind. Okay, so um, I, I would say if I were going to argue uh, for a lack of evidence, I would say he does seem to be, he does have an introvertish, introverted-ish affect, although I actually think he's an extrovert. Um, and he, he is comfortable to listen to, not awkward, not uh, cringy. You might find him boring, but he's not awkward and cringy. In other words, he's not making effy mistakes. So he's on that level, he would validate with INFJ. But I don't see much NI because that's just not what an NI approach to a topic looks like. Right. But the thing is, is that he's trying to sell to sensors because the world is mostly made up of sensors. So he cannot appeal to NI if most people won't receive NI. I, I don't get sensitive. Media is that calculated? No. Hello? Hi. Hey. Kyra, you want to chime in on this? Uh, I just joined in, so I don't know. Uh, I was gone for a little while, so I haven't heard any of the audio. So. Okay, well, you don't have any evidence. How about you, Global Map? Do you want to chime in on this? Yeah, I, I don't think he's an INFJ, but I couldn't give you any good reasons necessarily why, besides like a lack of. FB awareness for the most part, but that might just be because he's bored. Okay, so, all right, fine. Uh, S, S, you want to chime in anything on this? Uh, you want to throw him in the pit? <laughs> okay, well, S is, S is crying out for blood. Chris Chapman, you want any other further comments on his guilt or innocence or is beyond it, reasonable doubt? Uh, in one direction or the other? Or is there, is there, is there some neutral neutrality? Option. Yeah. You know, the, or if, the, if, the, if not, do I just vote to not, um, to not indict? Right. The neutral. Um, the neutral option is is to vote not guilty, because that's okay, not saying not, that's not saying he's innocent. It's just saying they didn't prove it enough for you. Okay. I. I that will be my, my All right, Chris Chapman's voting not guilty. I'm gonna vote guilty just to mix things up a bit. Sean bail before he cast his vote. How ENFJ of him? I mean, I want to vote guilty. I'll do. I'm right. voting. I'm also voting not INFJ. Guilty. Okay, so we got guilty. three guilties and one not guilty. Kyra, you yeah. can't really vote. Ash, you get to vote. Um, and S gets to vote. So we've got one not guilty, uh, one guilty, two guilty, three guilty. S is guilty, four guilty. What about you, Ash? Um, I withdraw from voting. I don't know. Then so these are not, not guilty. guilty. Okay. Um, so with a four to two verdict, that's what you would call. We didn't really decide ahead of time. It should be, it should be a mistrial. Yeah, it, it should be. Yeah, because in or, court you need 
or we deliberate unanimous. until we get in, or we deliberate until we get unanimous. Yeah. I could easily enough be switched over to not guilty. Um, it's it's a reasonable case to be made that the that there's not been enough evidence that he's not an INFJ, except for the way he talks being extrovertedly intuitive rather than introvertedly intuitive, mm -hmm. which seems kind of a big piece of evidence to me, but may not be sufficient to close the book on him, throw him in the slammer. You want to take uh, you want to take another vote with the uh, see how many others choose this time to either abstain or vote not guilty. Um, I'll change my vote this time. I'll go not guilty. We'll see if we can get unanimity. It, and it, you uh, you already are not guilty, Chris. Not host Mark. You want to change your vote? Nope. No, sorry. Sean O'Neill. You want to change your vote? He's definitely not INJ. No Okay, guilty, guilty, guilty. All right, well, it's four to two. Is that enough to send him to the slammer? I think that... Uh, I, I think didn't know that he's guilty, though. Did he say he's INJ? Okay, this is what I'm... I think that we should watch that that video where it talks about INFJ and see if he even mentions INFJ or if he thinks the woman that he's speaking to is an INFJ. All right, fine. That's a good, good point, well, Rachel. I didn't know he's guilty of saying he's Yeah, like, well, somebody told me that, but I took that on face sure. value. I haven't actually yeah. seen it myself. Well, All right, so let me I go. I told you that, but even I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to come to someone uh, and say he's an INFJ. <laughs> Rock. Right <laughs> He's guilty of talking about INFJs without being one. Which is so important in the development of humans um, from age zero to uh, seven is going to be dangerous and harsh and broken. And that child is going to grow up with um, what I call relationship habit, that you're, you're not able to believe yourself, and the only person that takes care of you is yourself. So we look at every child's attachment process, and help the parent make the child eventually level with their unconditional life. The pathological narcissist, um, that the child is somehow the pleasing or trophy child, they grow up with the um, relationship habit that I am human doing, that I take care of someone from love. That um, is impossible because um, these are codependents I know of who come from a healthy, happy family. Well, from what Brown's here, there's a lot of disorder, um, of personality types, introverts, or people who are highly sensitive. With regard to uh, personality type, we are all born biologically with certain genetically predetermined uh, personality traits, uh, characteristics. Uh, you know, so some, some, like my, so my son is shy. He's an introvert. Uh, there's the environment, his childhood had no bearing on him being shy or introvert. Um, it's just, it's, it's who we are. Um, the environment will shape that introversion and make it uh, insecure introversion, uh, make it uh, fearful, shame-based introversion, uh, or the environment can uh, shape that introversion or that shyness and make it confident, um, optimistic. Um, and that's the difference between a shy and introverted person who is successful, who does not connect um, their beliefs and what they can or can't do, and their introversion or shyness. Um, it might be more difficult if they have a job or a career and where they have to meet people and form relationships. That you know, they work harder. So introversion and shyness is independent of self-love deficit disorder. Um, with that said, if you are born to be naturally shy uh, or sensitive, um, some children are just more sensitive. And some you know, parents have multiple children. Well, you know, they have you know, one child right, 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 It doesn't know much about any of I am a J stuff. They're just born that way. And other children are just sensitive and you know, more you know, cautious because they're, I think, working with co-dependents of MSLEs for my whole career. And they come from all all shapes and sizes and flavors. I mean, shy, extrovert, talkative, um, you know, not talkative, you know. Great. Right, so you really don't think that numbers impact at all? It does not. I know for a fact that the cause of self love deficit disorder or co-dependency has nothing to do with shyness or introversion. That is not a dysfunctional trait. It's only dysfunctional if the environment um, shames a person into feeling bad about themselves. Um, there are so many people that are introverted and shy and sensitive that are really, really healthy. If you come from a family that embraces someone's shyness or introversion, um, life is more challenging for the introverted child. Life is more challenging for the shy child, for sure. But it doesn't cause... I say I agree with everything you're saying right here. You know, nothing to do with typology. No. I think you just put it in the title to like, just click there. Nothing to do with science. I think right. she's she's the brain. one. I need to be around people. The limbic system affects it. Activate my brain all the way. That's what extroversion is. There's nothing to do the with how behave or you behave. Brain literally, you need to be able to power you. Uh, who's person. it? There's nothing to do with being shy or anything. Look, this lady here. <clears throat> this lady, Sarah Cunn. <laughs> she is the one who probably talks about INFJs a lot. Yeah, let's see. Does she have a YouTube channel? 
Um, That's I her? I have to agree with the everything about how the guy's kind of giving off TV vibes. Like, I'm kind of thinking like I'm TV ish, sort of. Like, the way he's, he's actually talking, sort of. Um, I don't know. Seems kind of TE, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of thinking. All right. What is, who is this person? Who is this lady? Does she ever do What's anything that? else? She didn't have a, her own channel? No, I just, uh. No, it seems like she's the one who's interested in personality types, though. She's the one who's asking about personality and he he just keeps on going back to family life and nurture versus uh nature versus nurture like he doesn't his he he basic if your kid's shy that's your fault human being natural condition is to see if they're shy that's your fault because you didn't show them that you're not scared like whatever yeah. if, if, you're, if you're not trying if, if you're shy, i think he was wrongly arrested your parents' fault. He's yeah. not guilty. We're letting him go. He's not guilty. Look, um, this is why, you know, when I say somebody give me a good type of person, I, I've had so many people suggest me people before, but it's it's an art form to find me somebody to actually type in the type police, you know? If anybody um, wants to do that, that would be great. If they don't feel like doing that, I totally understand it. But um, that just... Not a good person to type, please. He just is a guy who likes to talk about uh, narcissism and his experience with it. That's pretty much it. All right, let's wrap this up, huh? Okay. Bye, everybody.